Welcome back to Upstream. Tim Padgett and I are going further upstream on my conversation with Nathan Johnson, whose talk on the seven liberal arts at the recent Davenant Institute Regional Convivium here in Florida, it just got my mind and imagination chugging. So Tim, welcome back. What did you think about the podcast? I enjoyed it. It was one of my favorite ones I think that we, we've had. The only thing I think that lacked was the thing you guys hinted at. Disgusting. What did you call it? The the sing the spheres, the Music of the spheres, yeah, right? The music yeah. of the spheres. I, I would love to hear, hear him come back and discuss that. I think that would be a fascinating conversation. I think we will. Just I'll just say at the outset here. I think I'll have him back on to talk about art and beauty because he got to that uh, a great deal more in his talk than we were able to in the podcast. We spent so much time on the defense of and classification of the seven liberal arts that we didn't really get to dwell on um, that whole issue of beauty, especially as it pertains to music. We talked afterwards quite a bit and. He just had some some wonderfully helpful remarks about what art means, what beauty is all about, why it's integral to education. So, I'll, uh, I'll hopefully I'll be able to circle back on that one. But this is you know this this is interesting as a conversation, and I've had several guests on to talk about education, and it's no coincidence. I'm on the board at my children's uh, classical Christian school here in Lakeland, Florida, and I have a friend who started another very similar school on the other side of the state. So it's a constant theme of conversation and conferences I've been to. And and I'm actually speaking at an event in just a few days on the same sort of topic. So it's on my mind constantly. And this is a very old way of education. This is what most people don't realize as they, as they approach this topic is that education in the West was seen as something much more than gaining technical proficiency to achieve a career, to succeed in a field and make money. It was about crafting people who could be free citizens and participate in their society and lead and live the good life. It was, it was much more holistic. Our mode of education now in the West is such a recent innovation that, A, it makes you wonder what kind of damage it's done, as Nathan hinted at. How much of the cultural chaos we're seeing today is a result of a changed philosophy of education? And B, it should humble us. It should help us to realize how arrogant it was to sort of retool education and then expect nothing to change or expect the world to, to get better. The wisdom of the ages points to some, a different method, a different philosophy, something richer, something more holistic than what we're doing today. Yeah. I think that there, uh, there's a lot in there. I mean, I think of the uh, critique that often happens is, you know, in, in older times, people didn't know anything and therefore we should use the more modern methods. Uh, We need to have modern methods of education People in ancient times, they didn't know that the earth went around the sun. They didn't know all sorts of things. They didn't have all the technology that we have. Well, there's a couple things wrong with that. One is that when you talk about some of those macro level things about not knowing that the earth went around the sun, well, there was a reason they thought the earth went around the sun. So I thought the sun went around the earth because it looks that way. And eventually, through the process of good education and good observation, they figured out it's the other way around. So it looked that way once they encountered new information and new instruments that allowed them to judge that information, they made those necessary adjustments. They were quite willing to learn. uh, Medieval is seen as an adjective, is just a modifier that's thrown out there to mean ignorant. The other thing that we need to remember in all that is we do have amazing technology. You and I are sitting 2,000 or so miles apart from each other and having a conversation that's amazing. But what is all this built on? This is all built on, yes, technological development built on years and generations of work. Many of the founders of those fields of study were educated in this style that you and Nathan Johnson were discussing. So it, it's it's a, a great example of someone uh, cutting off the branch that they're sitting on, uh, because by cutting off ourselves from this style of uh, education, from the, at least the insights, we don't have to take everything from previous times. There's no reason to do that. Actually, I was thinking about this when I was listening to your conversation. When you think about when people talk about the good old days, you know, they had Saturday Night Live was great in the 80s. That's my generation will say that, right? That whatever it was back in my day, well, what do we remember? We remember the good stuff that made it. Of course, there were lousy Saturday Night Live skits. Of course, there were lousy whatever pop culture thing. And yes, of course, there were some fools back in the past. But the reason that we want to listen to the past uh, is not only as a check to ourselves, but because the things that we held on to, The things that those who went before us held on to and passed on to their descendants, us, is because those particular things worked. Some things dropped by the wayside. But so again, when we take on these tradition things, we're not taking them on simply because they're old. We're taking them on 
but because they're old and they've lasted and they've continued to work. There's a reason that they did those things. It's just as foolish to get rid of something that's old because it's old as it is uh, to get rid of something. So to hang on to something that's new just because it's new, it's all nonsensical. In many ways, modern education seems to be preoccupied with the how as a question that, that guides all of our inquiries and, and studies. Education for centuries prior to the modern era was centered on the what and the why, especially the why. There are value questions. You know, it's, it's one thing to understand what the world is made of, what the world consists of and, and looks like, and even in some of how it works and so forth. But the, the why behind all of it is one of the central questions that people at one time considered worthy, worthy of asking, worthy of pursuit, the thing around which education itself should be centered. It's not enough to say, you know, here's how the numbers work. Here's how reading, writing, and arithmetic work. Now do with them what you will. Like Lewis said, when you do something like that, you're just creating clever devils. You're giving, you're creating technical proficiency in a population, but you're not telling them what it's for. You're giving soldiers weapons and you're not telling them who to fight. You're giving uh, tools to construct something to people who don't have any blueprints and have never been told what they should be building. That's the, that's part of the error of just equipping students with technical proficiency. And that's why the, I guess the seven liberal arts, and this is a neglected subject. So I'm aware of the fact that a podcast like this is doing a lot of reintroduction work. It's doing a lot of sort of remedial education that, and I include myself in that group who are just learning this for the first time in the last few years, I guess it makes you do a couple of things. First of all, it makes you recognize that that why is built into every, what we call subject that you teach in schools. It's not enough to just learn the, the mechanics of language. You have to actually understand what language is for. What, what is logic for? What is rhetoric for? What the, these subjects or mastery over language ultimately point to the deep order in the world, the givenness of creation, the fact that we live in an intentionally designed universe, not an accidental one. And therefore our actions in that universe cannot be arbitrary. They actually have to be in accordance with the telos of the things that are created. That includes ourselves, by the way. <laughs> We're not malleable Plato. And then the second thing it brings out is really the connections between everything. Because there's a, there's a cohesive order that connects grammar, logic, rhetoric. There's a cohesive order that connects arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And these, these are subjects that sound, that sound kind of small or parochial. It's like, okay, yeah, you know, it's great to have astronomy and music as uh, extra credit classes, but they mean something much broader than the word today tends to imply. And that's why and that's the case for a lot of words. You know, grammar tends to imply something much more focused and narrow and technical than what we, it, you know, the word syntax and how verbs and nouns and adjectives and so forth work. That's, that's it. Yeah, it means that. But that's not all that it means. And so there's a there's a comprehensiveness, there's a connection, and there's an intentionality. And all of that I see built into the, the project at a basic level in a way that students pick up on implicitly. Not they don't even have to be explicitly taught that. But what does it do to someone's mind, someone's spirit, to be told from day one, the world you live in is intentional. There's an order, there is a comprehensibility, everything is connected. And they're actually universal truths that are observable and can be articulated and learned and studied. You're all of a sudden, you're not in Nietzsche's world. You're not in a world where God is dead and you're thrown into existential quandary. Like, what do I do? What do I make of this world? Well, I'm God now. I can make anything of it I want. That's, that's the modern era. That is the post-classical Christian education, post-classical education mindset. And we are attempting in a talk like this, a podcast like that, and a school like my children go to, to ask questions that people were asking for many centuries before that, that built this civilization we live in, in which we're doing such a, an excellent job of sort of tearing down and devaluing at present. Yeah, to, to borrow a bit from uh, the conversation from last week about mythos and logos, it's almost like with the, the, the modern era, with the 20th century, look, again, we're going to blame Dewey, not just Wilson, that it was all logos and no telos, uh, that it was all about data, all about getting people informed of the right, inf getting them the right information. Studying for the test. Yeah, study for the test. Yeah, and, and teach for the test. 
And there was a lot of that. Just give the people the right information. Why, why do they do that? So they can go get a good career. Why do you want your kids? I mean, think about that. You know, this, I mean, it's a stereotype, but the, I think it's a stereotype with some basis in reality that you get your, your rich families who get their two year old playing violin and learning Mandarin so that she can get into the right preschool, so that she can get into the right grammar school, so that she can get into the right high school, so that she can get into the right thus and such. And it's all this purely utilitarian understanding of what education is for. It's, it's you learn so that the, the telos doesn't get any further than a good job, ultimately. And what, what is that good job going to get you? A nice retirement. And that's it. Uh, and then you kind of have the more postmodern thing of what, what is it without people kind of implicitly recognize they need a telos. And so often is what we see in the contemporary world is a rejection of uh, even the idea of logos, the idea that there's truth, that there's fact. Everything is about power dynamics. Everything gets into these you know, critical theory nonsense sorts of things where truth isn't truth, something existing beyond us. It is merely a question of my self-expression, my enhancement. How do I fit in these you know, larger structures? So wh what I think we see is that wh what – we need with true education is again the handing down the accumulated wisdom of the past and handing out the to recognize some of the beauties of what has happened. I think we need to to rethink what it means to have a successful life. This is one place where it's it's almost a pushback on on what uh, Johnson had said. I, I don't think he would disagree with this, so it's not exactly a pushback. When people, I think you asked the question, what do you say to the parents who are concerned that having this rich education will will leave them financially poorer? And that's a fair question. You know, what, what are they going to be left out of the world system? If you know, your kids and my kids who have alternative education styles, mine with you know, homeschools and co-ops and yours with the you know, classical Christian school, are they going to be left out of the uh, out of the system because they're not they don't uh, have all the right. They didn't go to the right schools and stuff like that. Not even like elite schools, just they didn't go through the public school. It reminds me that uh, meme you see on Facebook or Twitter. You know, the one person saying uh, on the one side, it's like, well, if you homeschool your kids and they won't be socialized into you know, the contemporary world. And the response is, that's the idea. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yes. It's like, that's the point of a lot of this. And his response was, I, th I think, a very good in many ways. And what he said was that you need to ask yourself, basically, isn't it worth it to be faithful and righteous, uh, even if it means being poor and stuff like that? Uh, that's a fair question. And so that's a fair response. I do think that, that that going to the spiritual element, but I think that we need to redefine what it means to be successful. And I, I just think of this is another point, like where we talked about some months ago about how that in abortion, it's hard to make a pro abortion movie. It's hard to make that work right. I think this is another situation where the world tells us the way to be happy is material accumulation. Uh, to to get the right job, to marry the right person, to do all these material external sorts of things. And that's what a successful life is. But how many times do we have movies from, you know, sappy Hallmark movies to, you know, romantic comedies and wh whatever other sort of story or, you know, Christmas Carol? The whole thing is the ultimate meaning and goodness in life aren't found in things like money or in title and status and the right cars. But they're, 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 they're so often the protagonist thinks they're getting that, then all of a sudden they realize they've left everything behind. Or there's the trope of, you know, how many people, how many men on their deathbed uh, say to themselves, oh, I wish I spent more time at the office. We recognize this. So I think what we need to do, with, it, it's, not, it's not in contradiction to what he said about uh, what a successful life is, you know, pointing to, you know, following Christ is, is a value. But I think we need to recognize what a true successful life should be, a truly contentment. The beauty of it, this is like the book of Ecclesiastes. So much of the book of Ecclesiastes is pointing to the emptiness of merely seeking pleasure. You might say that's the postmodern answer or seeking wealth, which is more the modernist answer. Each of these things, we kind of implicitly as a culture recognize the folly of these situations. And so I think that we see as most of us probably want for our children, while we say we want them to be successful and stuff like that, we would rather them not have as much money but be content with where they are, have joy, have their labor be meaningful, all those kind of personal things. So that's something I think that where the present educational system really fails is because it just points in one of two false directions, the self-actualization uh, thing of postmodernism or the you know self-aggrandizement of modernism. Yeah, it, that, that reminds me of uh, a scene from, uh, is it Conan the Barbarian with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Uh, yeah, yeah. Does he do that one? Oh, the, what is meaning? Yeah, what's a good life? Yeah, yeah, what is best in life, right? They throw around some different answers. 
he says, no, none of those are, are the right answer. And then Arnold, you know, comes out and he's like, <laughs> to crush your enemies, <laughs> to see them driven before you and to hear the lamentation of their women, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's like, <laughs> that's an impressive, uh, 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 Arnie impression there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, and it's sort of glib to say, it sounds sort of glib to say education is all about teaching students what is best in life. But that is the heart of the classical answer is that you're teaching value, you're teaching virtue, you're teaching the direction in which to aim your efforts and your mind and your soul in life. And then proficiency in subjects, those come as instruments or ways of reaching that goal. And so I really appreciated one thing Nathan brought out, and it's a mistake that educators who are interested in the classical model sometimes make. And they'll say that, you know, knowledge is an end in and of itself. Learning is an end in and of itself. It's not, they see the instrumentalization, the utilitarian attitude of the economic middle and upper class who say, like you just described, how do I get my kid uh, good grades so that they can get into a good college so that they can get a good job so that they can make a lot of money so they can have a good retirement? Yes, that is a cynical and materialistic way of looking at the world. But the response to that is not to say, well, knowledge is just good for its own sake as an ultimate end. Knowledge is, I think, there's a certain sense, limited sense in which you can say, and it sounds like Nathan agrees, worthwhile as a pursuit just for the sake of knowing, because we're creatures that are meant to contemplate and experience wonder at the goodness of the world. However, education in an ultimate sense is not an end in and of itself. It's a means designed to lead to God, designed, designed to lead to the ultimately what the Westminster Confession says is the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's the, uh, I mean, that's the core of the Christian part of the whole classical education model. I guess if you'd asked a Greek or a Roman uh, citizen who was familiar with the, the classical model of education and the developing liberal arts tradition, they would say, well, I'm learning this way so that I can participate in the polis as a good citizen to be a free man and to Maybe he would even throw in something about glorifying and bringing honor to the gods. So there, there may be some uh, gesture in that direction, although their theology is, uh, you know, obviously a completely different thing from, from Christian theology. But Christianity brings all this uh, together and integrates it and says, no, the, the chief end of man is to honor and glorify God, to worship him and enjoy him and contemplate him forever. It's the beatific vision, right? It's that that's the ultimate goal of mankind. And so when we raise kids, we're aiming them in that direction. And everything that we do is a means to that. Now, out of that emerges a question that I didn't get to ask him. And I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Does that mean that a classically informed education is impossible because classical Christian ed is inherently sectarian? Does that mean that it's really impossible to Say, if you wanted to reform, if someone brought you into the, the Department of Education and they were like, Tim, the schools around the country are failing. It's not good. We need to reform the way we teach kids. And we hear that you know some things about an older model, right? That, that maybe the founding fathers of this country would have been uh, better acquainted with, right? Because they learned Greek and Latin and all that stuff. The classics, they're constantly referring to, to mythology and the lessons that you learn from that stuff. So, so te help us to improve the schools in America using this classical model. Could you do that in an honest way? Or would you have to tell them, no, you see, as long as you're not declaring allegiance to Jesus and teaching the kids to, to, to pursue and honor Jesus, then it's the whole thing's a futile exercise. What do you think about that? That's a fun question. We could probably do several breakpoints and some books on that one. I think the, the, the short answer is no, it's not impossible. But it's, there's going to be a sense in which it's going to be an ultimately, not a fool's errand, but there's going to be some sense of inadequacy to it. One of the things that Francis Schaeffer taught, and I think is a good, th fair thing to say, is that the scientific revolution is due, he wasn't talking about classical education, but it is due significantly to the Christian understanding of the world. Understanding that the unit of the cosmos is created by a personal infinite God, uh, and because and He has created us in His image, and therefore we are capable of learning the nature of the universe, and therefore we scientific understanding. 
one does not have to accept that in order to take advantage of it. Again, to borrow from Schaefer, there's the whole Christian consensus idea. I think that uh, it's similar to the situation where the founding fathers, as, as you just said, many of them were not personally Christian, and they knew it. Uh, they were deists and whatnot. I mean, despite what some some Christian curricula will tell you, no, they were they were not they were not all God God fearing uh, Christians. Some a couple of them were. Yet all strangely convinced that Christian morality and teaching were essential for the republic. Yeah, yeah, they were drawing from Christian waters, sometimes knowingly, sometimes inadvertent, inadvertently. You don't get the contemporary, the good parts of contemporary society about justice and government and democracy without Christianity. This is where we get to quote Tom Holland all the time, right? You don't get it. It's, it's the sine qua non. You can, however, without being a Christian, you can, however, without believing that Jesus is the Son of God, without believing the whole Nicene Creed thing that I recited the other day in church, you can draw on those wells of Christian knowledge Without acknowledging, without believing, even while rejecting some of those, I think, key doctrinal things. Being a Christian doesn't make you a better scientist. Being a Christian doesn't make you a better politician. Being a Christian doesn't make you a better butcher baker, candlestick maker. However, being a Christian does give you an advantage that a non Christian would not have. So I would say that two people, you know, two complete twins who had identical education, except one was a believer and one was not, the Christian has a certain advantage, not an absolute advantage. But there's going to be a tendency towards a, a, an advantage of the Christian because he's going to not only have the philosophical understanding of the, of the Christian worldview and driven in much more firmly uh, because he's an actual believer, not merely a, a Christianist, you know, someone like a Winston Churchill, a Christianist. But also there's the Holy Spirit aspect. There is going to be an advantage to the Christian, but it's not necessarily going to make them smarter. It's not going to make them a more skilled musician. It's not going to make them a, a better leader of people and things like that. So yeah, the, the short answer is no, it's not impossible, but it's better with Christianity. What the Greeks discovered and what the Chinese discovered, and let's not just be solely Western here, but I do think there's something that the West got there, uh, pre-Christian West got, that the, the, the Egyptians discovered all sorts of things about you know, the, the stars. The Chinese learned all sorts of you know, uh, stuff about, you know, they did also in, interesting engineering stuff. They learned those things because, as Calvin talked about, many times God has blessed the pagans, as he said, uh, with greater gifts than the Christians. And they cannot help but to live in their father's world because this is God's world. And they can only interact with this, despite what some hardcore reform guys could say. They are learning from the, the observing the world. Being a Christian on top of that gives you a great benefit. So any educational system that does not include Christianity can go a long ways. But ultimately, it, it will sputter at points, and it probably would snowball at some point. But yeah, so Christianity is the sine qua non of all of this, and the ultimate goal at the same time. It's the, it's the telos. But it's so you can go a long ways without it, but it won't be as good as it would be with it. I guess the uh, Department of Education employee would say at that point, oh, that was very complex, Mr. <laughs> Padgett. I, I think we're going to call in someone else to try and right. <laughs> yeah. figure this out. No, it, it was exactly right. I think you're you're on target there and appropriately cautious with the answer, because I asked a similar question to Joe Rigney when I had him on to talk about uh, a related topic. Education overall was really the theme. And I asked whether it's possible to educate students into a kind of civic virtue, uh, good citizenship, in other words, morally good citizenship and full humanity in the sen in, a, in an earthly sense without converting them, without making them Christian. And of course, he's doing that in the context of Bethlehem College and Seminary, because inevitably there are going to be some kids who are just there because their parents sent them there, who don't have a, a very heartfelt commitment to the Christian faith and are not really destined to, to live it out. Could they benefit from that? And could they um, become better citizens and neighbors to live with because they have received a uh, an education that informs them in virtue and and ask the ask the why questions instead of just the the what questions of the world. And he said the answer is yes in a in a limited and proximate sense. And I, I think I agree with him on that. The part of the reason I agree is not just because I'm a Christian and convinced that this is a good model of education, but also because 
I've come to believe that a value neutral public square and a value neutral education are actually impossible. And the evidence is unfolding right before us. We, we did a break point today, actually, as we record this. So it'll be a couple of days as this goes live about the moralistic mysticism that seems to have seized the uh, political heights of America. So long gone are the halcyon days of the early 2000s when the sort of atheistic, secular, value neutral, relativistic project was ascendant or seemed like it was ascendant. The idea that we can actually just have, it was very much like a, the last gasp of modernism as a, as a philosophy that we can, we can very much have this value neutral public square. Everyone can participate in a pluralistic way. We can coexist just so long as we agree on these ground rules and uh, evidence, uh, reason, scientific investigation, peer review, empirical observation and confirmation. These are, these are the values by which we're going to govern our nation. Well, it turns out scientism isn't actually capable of answering the most important questions uh, that mankind asks, like, is this good? Ought we do this? What is marriage and what is it for? Why is the government involved in it? Why is it wrong to do certain things with children? You know, the questions that have a deep bearing. Oh, when does a child become a huge, you know, when does a child come into existence? Is, is the thing in the womb a human person? Qu- questions that people inevitably ask take you into areas of value judgments, which is the realm or has been dismissed as the realm of religion and spirituality, uh, or at least ethics. And into that void rush answers. If they're not Christian answers, they're going to be some other kind of answer. And we see that now the, the rise of the woke movement, the, the reason you get a, an entire auditorium lecture hall full of white coated med students swearing to uh, honor in inclusion, diversity, equality, and to give place to traditional and indigenous methods of healing, right? Types of medicine. I mean, they're essentially, as, as John said at Breakpoint, committing in word, at least, to take rhinoceros horn and drum circle healing as <laughs> prescriptions as like a, a serious type of medicine. Well, they're not. And God help the doctor or the patient, I should say, who's subjected to that kind of quote unquote medicine. But the, the point is, there's a value there that's overriding the concern for scientific objectivity. And the value is, well, the whole the whole slew of, of liberal progressive values that have come to dominate the, the public sphere. And those are value judgments. They're not th- as as Glenn Scrivener was at great pains to demonstrate in his book. They are not supportable through empirical observation. You cannot see tolerance under a microscope. <laughs> you can't find human rights in a telescope or a hadron collider or something. <laughs> they're not, they're not there. There's something entirely different that's inaccessible to the tools of, of observation and science. So where does that leave us? I don't know that I have the answer to that exactly in the sphere of, I, I know what the answer is in the sphere of, of churches and family. It's to tell them about Jesus Christ and to teach them that he is the way, the truth and the life. I don't know exactly what the answer looks like on a political or national level. So about, you know, back to that department of education functionary who's asking you to help them reform the system. Uh, that's a good question. Do you have to, do you have to at least teach a kind of generic theism? And that gets back to the American project itself, right? The constitution doesn't, doesn't acknowledge. This is just me spitballing. I'm just asking questions because I don't know. I just don't know. But does the constitution acknowledge God? Well, no, it doesn't certainly doesn't acknowledge Jesus Christ, but there's a very strong case to be made. And I think Oscar Ennis, among others have made this case that Christian theism. It's like a spirit that just runs through the whole American project. And it's kind of assumed on a whole bunch of levels. And when you read the founders, they, they all said, this whole thing depends on Christian morality and virtue. If you don't have that, it collapses. I mean, th- those kinds of statements are just, you can multiply those endlessly. So they were convinced of something. It's not generically applicable to any people. You couldn't take a nation of 350 million Muslims and put the United States constitution over them and, and it work. I don't think that's a controversial statement. It actually depends on some kind of mere Christendom in the culture. So 
what does that look like if you're reforming public education? I don't know. If, until someone asks me to help them reform public education, I guess I can keep contemplating the answer. But those are, you know, those are interesting questions because not everyone is going to agree with the Christian worldview and the Christian goal of education. Does that mean we can't educate without an explicit Christian commitment? I don't think it does, but I'm not sure exactly how, how, what the nuts and bolts of that look like. I mean, I think that one of the things we can do with this is something, it was actually one of my favorite points that he brought up in, in, in y'all's conversation was that uh, people will see the goodness. It's, it's one of those, we're, we're going to take the fake quote of St. Francis, you know, if, if preach always, if, if necessary, use words. Okay. It's a nonsensical comment, but there's something in there as well. It's also probably not legitimate to him, but there is something to the witness of the daily lives of Christians. Just the fact that if Christianity is really a true reflection of the world, and we inculcate ourselves and our children in that those ideas about Christianity, then we will live, in a sense, more successful lives after a fashion. That doesn't mean there won't be pain, so it doesn't mean there won't be hardships and all sorts of things. But it means there will be something on the aggregate, uh, a light that will come from Christians. And you see this in, in, in our favorite author, C.S. Lewis, the line he said about the world that doesn't need more Christian books. It needs something effective. It doesn't need more Christian books. It needs more books by Christians. He said it a little bit more elaborately. But it's, it's one of my favorite lines. Uh, because I do think that that is something that is one of the most potent things we can do. Uh, and it reminded me of an example from uh, my wife. She taught uh, about 20 years ago now uh, in China, taught English over there. And uh, she told me that, at least at the time, again, it's been 20 years. Xi Jinping is further turning himself into Mao part two. Uh, so it probably wouldn't hold true anymore. But she said that the Chinese authorities often preferred the Christians who came over to teach English over against the secular Westerners or those who are coming over to find the enlightenment of Buddhism or something like that, because the Christians showed up for work and the Christians worked hard and they did all these sorts of things. This wasn't because the Christians were offering their testimony. It was simply because inculcated again in Christian ethics, you work hard, you show up on time. That's what you're supposed to do anyhow. And so that that had an effect. So I think that we can build is kind of this cultural transformation by creation. Rather than, I mean, you see all the debates they're, they're going around about Christian nationalism and stuff like that, and the focus is so much on seizing power. And pe other people talk about, you know, seizing the, uh, the high points of education and culture and stuff like that. Well, rather than trying to seize some of these things, we may not be in a position to do that anymore. That, that I would say, so, uh, sailed decades ago. What we can do is create the best schools. And then people start to send their kids to these best schools. And it's not about manipulating them. It's about showing them in the teaching, in the lives that we can live out before them, uh, the truth of Christianity. So it's not just uh, about an argument. It's about living out the truth that's there. And that's got to be full. That's got to take in the beauties of general revelation, take in the insights of special revelation and live it out, not just argue it out. And I think that that is kind of our project now is to build. Not to, not to, again, with the imagery you've used before, it's not just the walls, it's the gardens. We need to build. Uh, and I think that's the Christian calling at this moment. You mentioned in your notes that you sent over to me, Tim, the opposite possibility, where often Christian so-called Christian education ends up being just secular education with a few external changes. So uh, people will call it that. And There'll be some music that sort of sounds a lot like secular music, but, you know, has Christian lyrics. There'll be, uh, what was the example? What was the, the phrasing you, you used? It's like doing math with shepherds. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my, my father, he helped to start the school that I graduated from. And when he would talk to churches about why they were doing what they're doing, he said, Christian education is not one shepherd plus two shepherds is three shepherds. It's not, yeah, it's not merely taking the secular education, throwing some Christian words on it, and then ta-da, that's Christian education. Well, I wonder why, you know, this, this question is actually a really important one to ask, because I wonder if the faux Christian education is at the root of some of the troubling statistics that we see. So this week at, in the Breakpoint editorial team, we're batting around this story about a, a study that has purportedly shown that homeschoolers and private schoolers are just as likely, if not more likely than their public school peers to end up identifying as LGBTQ etc. I have a lot of questions about the sort of survey and what's going on there, but assuming that's basically true, it raises the question, of course, of what their education was like. What exactly is going on there? I think a lot of people assume that what's going on is a sort of 
backlash against overly strict and restrictive or isolating tendencies in a, in a homeschool setting or a private school setting or what have you. I wonder if it, it could actually be that both of them operated in such secular ways with a few Christian trappings thrown on top that they failed to deliver any of the goods that they, that they promised. And I've seen that sort of thing at work. I've seen the basically the basic uh, technical proficiency model of education in a Christian wrapping. And that's not classical. That's not Christian education, period. It's not class, certainly not classical Christian education. I mean, not even if you have a Latin class thrown in there, (laughs) it's which I, I, of course, did. And I think that a lot of credit goes to my parents and my teachers in the co-ops that I participated in as a middle schooler and high schooler because they were classically informed. It was sort of a hodgepodge, but they were informed by that model. But not all of them are. And so I wonder what's actually going on there and if it could be exactly the phenomenon you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think some, in some senses it is. It's not, they're nominally Christian schools. Uh, who they just take secular stuff and throw on throw Jesus in there instead of whoever else. And that's kind of the, you might say that's the equivalent of all these mainline and progressive churches that have dropped all the doctrines, but they keep the, they keep the, they keep the arches, they keep the robes, they keep the collars and all that kind of stuff. It's, there's nothing substantively Christian. And eventually these churches die out because why keep going to them? Because they're saying the same thing as the world. So you get kids who go to nominally Christian schools and then they go off to college. Like, why do I want to keep the trappings? I don't want the trappings. I don't need that. I think the other thing is more on the fundamentalist end of things. There's kind of a know nothing impulse, and I think a lot of Christian education that tries to hide. Basically, it's trying to hide people from the world. And I, I, in the notes, I think I gave the example. The extreme case of this is people who say that since uh, since the these girls, their, their highest goal in life should be to be a wife and mother. All they need to know is basically how to read recipes, and not much more. People don't are not quite that explicit, but close. And that's such a foolish way to do things. I mean, there's other examples like thinking, actually, I've seen a uh, editorial cartoon from 100 plus years ago talking about the the young parishioner, this young man, he's in, he's in school, uh, he's learning, he loves God. Then he goes to a secular college, then he goes all, it goes down these series of steps till he finally goes off to the German university, because at the time that was the center of so many theological studies, and he loses his faith. He becomes a devil in, you know, in a preacher's disguise. I think that there's, there's people who are so afraid that people be corrupted by the world uh, that the, that our children would be corrupted by the world, that they don't train them. So these kids, they get up and they don't have any way to engage with the world. They've been only taught, like you guys hinted at in your conversation, they've been taught how to read the Bible and that's about it. They don't know how to think about the Bible. They don't know how to think about genres within the Bible. And the, then someone comes along with a, you know, atheist website level understanding of the Bible and blows them away because they don't even know how to defend against that. Not realizing there's been 2,000 years of Christian reflection on all of these subjects, and there's all the stuff they can draw upon. So again, people, the kids who, I'm not going to do it, I'm certainly not going to say an absolute case. Many people are well-educated and lose their faith. But I would say fundamentally, I would say that the trend would be that those kids who go off to college and lose their faith, there's going to be a significant correlation between having had kind of a, a surface level education in terms of the integration of all of these things. They don't know how to defend against the truths of Christianity, uh, sorry, against, against the attacks on the truths of Christianity. And so that we fail them because we didn't prepare. It's, well, it's, it's like, the, like the virus theory. I think Casey Leander wrote something about this recently, the contagion and the idea that uh, what we need to do is we need to prepare our kids to engage with the world because if we don't, they're going to get bowled over. So this experiment that we brought up in the break point was fascinating. And I'll just, I'll just read from a, a prior break point where we brought it up. We said uh, the psychologist William McGuire performed a series of experiments in which he tried to convince subjects of a lie that brushing their teeth was bad for them. Unsurprisingly, those with no preparation were easily convinced to stop brushing. Also, unsurprisingly, those who were warned against a specific bad argument were harder to deceive. What surprised McGuire were the groups who were easiest and hardest to dupe. The group that was most vulnerable to falsehoods about dental hygiene was not the one with zero preparation, but the one who'd merely had the truth reinforced. Subjects who were told, you know, brushing your teeth is good for you, right? The least vulnerable group were those who had been inoculated against the bad argument, given a response, and then warned they would face other bad arguments and would have to respond. So the, that's the immunity nature of it. It's almost like a vaccination or an, an inoculation against the bad idea. So merely reinforcing the good 
and then turning the person out there to confront lies actually renders them more vulnerable to the lie than those who have just uh, never even encountered the claim before. That's astonishing. But don't miss the ones who are most in the, who are most resistant. It's the ones who are given a sample of what they're going to face and then said, you will face more and that, that, uh, you know, have obtained the ability to anticipate um, not only the arguments they will face, but the fact that they're going to face arguments they haven't been prepared for and need to continue to prepare for. That's, uh, you know, that's instructive. And that's the sort of that that gets to the the question of what exactly we're doing when we call our education Christian. Are we just reinforcing the Christian truths? Are we preparing students for something more? Are we giving them the proficiency to ask and answer questions on their own? That's ultimately what it, that study seems to get down to for me. And I have to conclude that a lot of homeschooling and a lot of uh, private schooling has failed to do exactly that, failed to turn out independent thinkers and has instead turned out, you know, students who can, who can parrot Christian truths, but who don't really necessarily know why or how to defend those truths. That was instructive. Yeah, it creates brittle thinkers, not nimble thinkers. Brittle thinkers. I love that way of putting it. That's really good. I wanted to say one more thing here, Tim, because I've noticed a, a thread that's tying in all of these conversations about education. And it goes back to these two great words that I learned uh, reading Carl Truman's book, and that is uh, poiesis and mimesis, right? So he makes this claim that our cultural moment comes down fundamentally to a worldview that is poetic. And that doesn't mean it rhymes. It means that it, 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 is, it is based in a view of values that starts inward and works outward. So it says, I find ultimate value within in my heart, what does every Disney movie tell you to do? Look within, into your heart. You have all you need right here. And someone always points at your chest and stuff. That's, that's the um, poetic view of the world. And then you externalize that onto your, your world, which is a blank canvas or clay that you can shape however you want. And it doesn't take a genius to see how that leads to exactly where we are today. The older view is the mimetic view. Which takes the which observes the truths in the created world around us, assuming that there's a purpose and a design to that world, and then internalizes those truths, conforms you in your life to the truths you see around you. I see the divide between modern education and classical education as essentially along those lines. Uh, classical education, certainly a Christian one, would be mimetic. It would say, "What are the truths that are external to me and that are given in being itself?" And how can I internalize those and conform myself to those truths, whether they be metaphysical, moral, mathematical, whatever. You have to conform yourself to the truth. You can't make up your own truth. And the other side is, is poetic. It says, here are a bunch of tools that you can use. We don't know why they work, but they work in a utilitarian fashion. And you can use them to express yourself and externalize your internal sense of selfhood to be an expressive individualist. That's the that's the whole project. And we're not going to tell you beyond that, how to use them. Good luck, kid. That seems to be the divide to me. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a lot in that because it's, it's interesting as you were describing that, I, they realize as much as we can't like to contrast modernism and postmodernism, they both had a very utilitarian understanding of, of education. This century plus long project of making new education, new rejecting this older method that we've been talking about. Both of them see education in this point, as you said, poetic a means to an end. A means to an end, a means to an end for you, uh, a tool for you to do this rather than seeing your place, rather than you seeing your place in the harmony. You know, I might say learning a violin, uh, learning to, to learning to use music is so you can make money or learning to do music and you create your own. You get the nonsensical sorts of music you have with postmodern stuff. And it reminds me there, there is a, a scene in, uh, I think it was uh, Francis Schaeffer's uh, How Should We Then Live series. I watched those with uh, my wife before, before she was my wife. Okay, very cool. That's what homeschool kids do when they're dating. Of course, yes. Uh, th they are very instructive. The uh, uh, production qualities need some updates. Uh, yes. <laughs> but there's a scene, he I think he talks about that there's this guy. Now, my, mind you, well, part of his whole theory of things is that there's this drip effect from culture, you know, higher ph philosophical things that drips down to the fine arts and eventually to common areas. And we would now be in a time where many of these ideas are on the ordinary people. He was talking about this is from the 60s or 70s. And there's this guy writing, uh, doing a um, new wave kind of movies 
where trying to show that life was meaningless and that there's no meaning in life. It is, everything is discordant. But the guy wanted to use Bach as the soundtrack. And he re- apparently this guy realized he couldn't write a movie script about how life was meaningless while listening to Bach. Because Bach, it, it too much. I and mean, he loved Bach, but he couldn't say it. You can't listen to Bach and say, yeah, life's meaningless because it's, it's almost mathematical. I and mean, going back to y'all's conversation about the connections of math and, uh, and music and things. No, oh, because the music is telling you what a liar you are with every exactly. yeah. measure. We, we recognize in Bach, even in, you know, uh, even as you know, time goes on with you know, Beethoven, it's much more, you know, the tumultuous and stuff like that. And Tchaikovsky, you recognize there's a beauty, something, there is something there. And I think that might be where the, the link between the, our, our fictional state department or not state department, education department person and what we could say is that we're pointing to something that's recognizable. They can recognize the truth of what it is. What, what we can do as education is we point to this higher harmony of which we are all a part as opposed to simply this utilitarian, either get a job or express yourself and, and create your own identity. And by the way, I think my answer to that Department of Education employee would be abolish your department, <laughs> um, get the federal government out of the business of education and uh, let the states take it back over. And we can just send classical educators to each state capital to sort of uh, deal with things from there. <laughs> well, Tim, thanks so much. This has been fun. And uh, as always, I look forward to next week. Sure thing. See you then.